Right, mm. people, I think everybody's here. So, um, well, Tom's pretty much introduced himself already. Um, he's been to the club before. Judging, <laughs> yeah, judging our black and white competition uh, and has come to do a talk about all traits, which I'm sure, knowing Tom, will be brilliant. So, um, over to you, Tom. <laughs> uh, so, I'm going to share my screen. So, I'm hoping that you're going to, you're going to, um, where is it? Uh, there we go. Uh, share. You won't recognise. You won't. That's my. That's my last photograph, which I've got up. Uh, let me go to my first photograph. You should all see a picture of a gentleman that you recognise. Do you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Now, uh, have I? I can't remember if I've actually been to H two ever to do a presentation before. No. 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 So I don't think you. You. So normally, obviously, if we were if we were face to face. I would get you to make, you know, I would, I would be asking you lots of questions and we'd make this as interactive as possible. And that's a little bit more difficult to do on uh, Zoom. Having said that, if you do have a question, uh, then please interrupt me or stick it on uh, the, 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 the uh, chat function at the bottom or, or even better, just interrupt and, and ask a question. That's absolutely fine. I don't mind. That's what we'd do if we were face to face. And um, I'd like this to be as close to a, a normal sort of club evening uh, presentation uh, as possible. So don't, don't feel shy, just ask away. I will put in a break um, about halfway through so we can go and refresh our drinks and all that sort of thing. Cool. And of course, one of the advantages of Zoom is you can sit here with your glass of whatever your favourite tipple is and <clears throat> drink away whilst you're listening to the, to the talk. So, so <laughs> enjoy that. Um, and then we're going to talk uh, today about uh, portraiture, which is um, one of my favourite things. I guess I'm a, first and foremost, I'm a landscape photographer, which you would expect from something like Quest um, with all its landscape trips. Landscape and architecture is probably what I'm, uh, what I do most of. Uh, but we all take portraits inevitably, even if it's just, you know, snapshots of the family. So, so we do that. So what I'm going to try and do as we go through uh, this presentation is I'm going to, um, I'm going to hang everything under this question, what is a portrait? And the way I'm going to try and answer that is I'm going to look at, um, uh, so some of the philosophy behind portraits and I'm going to ask various other questions which is like what is the relationship between the person who's taking the photograph and the person who's being photographed that's always an interesting relationship um, always fascinating there's a lot that can come out from investigating that relationship I also want to ask another question about um, where does meaning come from in a portrait so not only is what is a portrait in a literal sense but uh, metaphorically what is it as well what does it tell us about um uh, uh, about not only a character perhaps but perhaps more than that and this would be a great example this particular portrait is a great example of ex exactly what i mean by that so we all know winston churchill and we all probably have when we think of churchill we may well even have this particular photograph in our mind when we think of him it's, um, it's probably as famous a photograph is as his sort of stentorian tones are when he was doing his great speeches in the House of Commons. Um, uh, we all recognize those instantly as well. And this is one of those instantly recognizable photographs. It is of course by Yusuf Karsh. And we'll come back to the story behind the photograph much later in the, the presentation. But, but what I want to focus on just right now to, to try and illustrate this idea about what is a portrait is, when you look at Churchill here, of course, we all see Churchill, we see his features. And that's one reading of a portrait. But with this one, we see so much more. When you look at him, you go, look at his face. He has that growling, um, stubborn look about him, the set of his chin, the mouth, the eyes that are staring out at the camera. Look at the way his hands are placed on his hip, the hand on the back of the chair, he looks like the British bulldog that we can come to associate with Churchill. Um, and that goes even further. It, it associates with a whole era, a era, an era in British history that we are extremely nostalgic about in some ways uh, nowadays. And this image stands for it. British spirit, the island race, standing up for itself. 
I mean, it, it, it is an incredible image because we get all of that almost symbolically. We take all of that out of this particular photograph. And that's a hell of a lot of information to take from a portrait. But I think everyone, uh, everyone, uh, any Brit looking at this would instantly feel all of those things. So what I want to try and do is, as we go through the presentation, unpack a little bit how that happens. Why does that happen? What's actually going on? Where does that come from? Okay, so that's how I've set it up. So let's go, uh, let's uh, move on. So from the sublime to the ridiculous, what have I been doing over the last uh, two or three months? Well, um, I, I love portraiture, but I must admit one of, the, one of the areas of portraiture that I've been slightly wary of um, uh, is flash photography, flash, you know, uh, studio light photography. So I challenged myself during the lockdown to have, to get a little bit better at, um, at studio photography. And, uh, I bought myself, uh, a little studio kit. It's a Godox camera, quite, uh, Godox flash, quite a cheap one. Um, uh, and a stand and a couple of, um, uh, umbrellas and, and boxes and what have you. And I thought I'd have a go. So here is, uh, my family. <clears throat> so, this is a recent photograph by me, and I was, there's a sprinkling of my photographs as we go through. And uh, what I did was, of course, I've, uh, as a family, um, I took the individual portraits, and then I put them together and, and put my daughter in the middle. That's a classic pose by my daughter. And uh, the rest of the family were all reacting to her um uh, because that's in effect what we do so we've gone from the sublime of, of churchill to the more ridiculous of the peck family household but i think that that captures the spectrum of portraiture it goes everywhere everywhere from the famous through to you know um family photography and we're going to look at some of those trends so uh, that's how we're going to do it so here is how we're going to actually go through it so we're going to look at some definitions uh, first and foremost and we're just going to go very quickly back into a little bit of painting uh, history just to, to uh, give ourselves a bit of context then i'm going to take us right back to the beginning of photography right into the victorian era look at some early photographs some early portraits then we'll um uh, have a, a quite a deep look at portraiture and the family i think that is probably the most photographed genre of all if you if you start including snapshots and now mobile phone photography and all that sort of thing it's the family that gets photographed it's your nearest and dearest then we're going to look at um a couple of particular eras of photography so we're going to look at what was called the modern age so this is just after the first world war through to just before the second world war new objectivity. I'm going to take as a theme social documentary. There are loads and loads of photographs that, are, that have a background in social documentary. You'll recognize some of them. Then I'm going to look at a, a, um, an area where I think uh, uh, portraiture blurs with other things. So that is looking at fashion, the relationship between, uh, between fashion and photography, and celebrity and photography, and even notoriety and photography. Uh, and then we'll finish off with two uh, uh, shorter sections, one about politics, war and crime, and the last one will bring it up to the modern day with uh, postmodernism, which is one of those words that everyone gets scared of, but we're not going to get scared of it. Dive into it and have a, have a good look. So that's how I'm going to take us through the next um, uh, hour and a half or so. Um, so let's dive straight in. So here we have, well, first of all, uh, do we all recognize him? This is Rembrandt van Rijn, the great Rembrandt. Perhaps painter the, in painting history, the greatest portraitist of, of all time. And not only that, probably one of the greatest self-portraitists. This You could call this a 1640 selfie. Uh, he painted himself, I don't know, 40 or 50 times in his career. Uh, and it's really interesting just to have a look back at a couple of those pictures. So this one is self-portrait of age 34. When we look at uh, Rembrandt here, what do we actually see? Well, if we look into his face, and his eyes and his pose and his arm that's on the balustrade there and his clothing, the fur uh, collar, the rich embroidered cloak, the cap, the felt cap, interestingly painted in black to create a lot of contrast with his uh, lit face. That's a photographic technique if you want, uh, but used very much by Rembrandt. What do we see? Well, we see a self-confident man, a man sure of his ability. I think you get that from this picture very much. This looks like a confident, 
painter who knows what he's doing, portraying himself as successful, etc., etc., etc. And we, we sort of absorb that almost without thinking about it as we look at the image. Contrast that with a later self-portrait by Rembrandt. This is uh, it's called Self-Portrait with Two Circles, sort of a descriptive title. This is Rembrandt much later in his uh, life. He'd lost his wife by this time, Saskia. Uh, his wife had died. Um, he'd, in fact, he'd lost his kids as well. They'd all died too. Uh, he was uh, much older. And, uh, and I think when you look into his eyes this time and you look at his pose, you see a different man. It's not the same. It is literally the same man as before. But you see a different character coming back to us. Look into those eyes. They have doubt in there. They, they have the, the, uh, the experience of a long life. They have sadness, the set of the chin, the mouth. You feel that you can, you can feel something of the pain that this man has and the experience this, that this man has had as he's gone through life. And I think that is that it is fascinating that you get that. Um, now that is partly down to the skill of Rembrandt as a painter. It's also down to his skill as a model. I mean, he was painting himself. He was looking at himself in a mirror when he was painting these things, and he painted what he saw, managed to capture what he saw. And that idea that is it the painter, is it the model? Where's meaning coming from? How is that created? That's one that we're going to try and look at a little bit as we dig into this. So let's have a look at some portrait definitions first of all. So Wikipedia, good old Wikipedia, we'll have a look at that. Um, a portrait is a painting, photograph, sculpture or other artistic representation of a person in which the face and its expression is predominant. The intent is to display the likeness, personality and even the mood of the person. I think we'd all understand that perfectly and we'd associate that with the, the images that we'd already seen. But let's have a look at Richard Aveson who was... Um, primarily a fashion photographer in the 50s and 60s. Let, let's look at what he said. A photographic portrait is a picture of someone who knows that he or she is being photographed. And what he does with this knowledge is as much part of the photograph as what he's wearing or how he looks. In other words, the model, the person being photographed is very much aware of the fact that they're being photographed and they react. They react to the fact of being photographed and they give something either well we'll have a look as we go through the image we'll question what is the model giving to the photographer so let's go right back to the beginning we'll scoot through this relatively quickly if we go right back to the very beginning the start of photography uh the very first photographic images were daguerreotypes invented by louis jacques monde daguerre in france they were very uh, complicated processes. We've got a little diagram there on the left of how that works. They used to be uh, photographed on uh, a copper plate. You could only make one image. It wasn't a reproducible plate. So you had to hold it. You had to sensitize it. You had to put it in the camera. You had to expose it. You then had to pour a load of very noxious chemicals over it, re-expose it and fix it. And then you would get one image that was, um, that was uh, then fixed and usually uh, mounted in a, in a little box or frame. And uh, an example of a very early picture there, that's the view of the Boulevard du Temple taken in 1838, so right at the very beginning of photography. It had to be a long exposure. It's a Parisian morning, 8 a.m. in the morning. You would expect the streets to be bustling, but of course they're empty because the long exposure has allowed everything that's moving to disappear, apart from the shoe shiner who is still visible there because he was static for so long. So that, it's a very early photograph. But let's have a look at a, a slightly later photograph as an example of a daguerreotype portrait. So daguerreotypes became very popular. Uh, lots and lots of photo studios set up across the world. This one is from South Walden Horse, which was a Boston studio. There were something like 50 studios in Boston or, uh, by this time. And it's a studio portrait. It's, it's interesting to look at what is happening in this uh, portrait and why is it happening. So first of all, it looks like they're two sisters. Uh, they've come along to be photographed. Clearly, they've got themselves dressed up. Uh, for the photograph. Uh, look at the detail that you get on the ladies' dresses, particularly the one on our right as we look at it. Look at the way they've made themselves up, the chignons in the hair. They've taken a lot of care about the way they look. They are presenting themselves to be photographed. In the background, we can see what looks like a pillar in the background. It's uh, They're leaning on a chair. It has all the sort of trappings of 
as if they were going to be painted. They almost look as if they were going for a portrait sitting in a painting sense, except that the medium is photography. And that's exactly what this is. I'm not so sure we can tell that much about the characters of these two girls here, apart from the fact they look like they come from wealthy, sort of upper middle class families, and they've clearly got themselves done up uh, for the photograph. Apart from that, it's relatively difficult to understand. We're not, we're not getting a, a stronger sense of their characters coming through it. Well, just about the same time as the daguerreotypes had been invented, it was, I mean, it was invented almost the same time, but it became popular a little bit later, was William Henry Fox Talbot's uh, uh, different process of taking photographs, which is much more akin to what we then came to know of as, as film, which we called calotypes at the time. Here he is in 1841 with his camera. And this was a, a negative printing out process. You could make copies of the, uh, of the negative once it'd been uh, presented. Anyway, this became very popular and it was different from the daguerreotype. So here is an example, again, right at the beginning of the photographic period of a color type in the um, uh, Fox Talbot style using his methodology. And this one is taken by uh, David Octavius Hill and Rob Adamson, who went up to Scotland and they photographed the, um, uh, the village in the village of New Haven. And this particular photograph is, a, is of a chap called James Linton, his boat and his bands, and around about 1843. Now compare that to the last photograph. This is completely different. First of all, it's outside. So we have a very different lighting straight away, uh, but the posing and the uh, the way the photograph is constructed is also very different. James Linton there looks very proud. He's gazing out the camera. He's leaning on his boat, presumably his fisher boat. Uh, you can see just on the left hand side, it's got his name on the opposite side to where it says New Haven. Below him are his kids. They're metaphorically being protected by the boat and they're being protected by him. And he's sort of uh, leaning over them and protecting them. They're his family. So we suddenly we're, we're into the realm of a completely different uh, photograph, which is telling us a lot more about the character of this chap, his standing in society, his relationship to his kids, etc., etc. So we're in the re re realm of social documentary, a very different style. If we come a little bit later, up to 1857, here we go. Suddenly the rich and famous... Uh, are, are, have latched on very, very quickly to the importance of photography as a way of disseminating their image. Uh, we're already in the world of spin. It starts straight away. Hey, it hasn't started with photography. It was there with portrait painting, but uh, uh, it, it moves into photography very quickly. So this was all about famous people making themselves even more famous. And here we've got Isambard Kingdom Brunel standing in front of the launching chains of the Great Eastern, his great ship. And what a fantastic portrait this one is. It tells us so much about the man himself, his role in society, and how he perceives himself as well. So let's just unpack that a bit. So, of course, he's standing in front of these massive chains. So immediately we go, this is a man, uh, we know he's responsible for it. So we go, this is a man of... Uh, of great importance. He was one of the great engineers of his time. Look at his stovepipe hat on there and he's chewing on his cigar. He's got a lot of confidence in that figure as well. He's got a sort of quite a relaxed pose. He's wearing the, in inverted commas, uniform of the day, a bow tie, he's got his waistcoat, he's got his jacket, the stovepipe hat. Um, but look how he's wearing it. He's sort of got that nonchalant air around it. Scan down to his trousers look they're dirty they're dirty trousers those boots are all scuffed up from the mud that he's been uh, wading through metaphorically this is telling you about what this man is a great man definitely an important man definitely a man that is not afraid to get his feet dirty and get stuck in um, so uh, again a character that gives us so much more about uh, the photograph that gives us so much more about the character when you start to unpick it. And it isn't bad King to Brunel definitely would have thought long and hard about how to project his image out to the viewer. So I don't think any of that is by chance. He chose to be like that when this photograph uh, was taken. Uh, one of the areas of photography, we're going to look at a couple of areas of photography that have sort of 
drifted out of uh, usage nowadays, but one of the most important of those in terms of spreading the popularity of portrait photography were known as cartes de visite. They were the equivalent of business cards that we use today, except they had photographs of, um, of uh, their owners on them. And these examples are, of course, of Victoria. So on the left, you've got Victoria and Albert uh, relatively early on in their uh, marriage uh, and, and their um, uh, and Victoria's reign. And then on the right, you've got a much later one. This is Victoria. Our, our Albert clearly has died. She's been in mourning. She was in mourning for a long time. She had to be encouraged to come out of mourning. And one of the ways in which she was reintroduced into society was through cartes de, de visite. And what these were, they're small cards. You would go into a photo studio. The photo would take a, a photograph that would give you eight little um, prints on a card which you could cut up, stick onto cards, and then you could hand them around. They got collected. There's a whole mania behind this. And the more famous people you could collect, the, the more scan you had. It was like nowadays little, little boys collect those cards that you stick, uh, uh, football players that you stick in, um, in an album. This is the equivalent. This is where it sort of came from originally, but on a much greater and bigger scale. Can't de visite. Another area, genre of uh, portraiture, I wonder if anyone can guess what this is. Uh, again, this is uh, one of the areas perhaps we could be very thankful that we don't have anymore because these are uh, death portraits of kids that have died in childhood. Uh, the Victorian era was, um, uh, was a very tough era for, era for infant mortality. And one of the things that photography allowed parents to do was to take uh, a photograph of their kids. Obviously, it was still very difficult to take photographs. Um, but if a kid died, then there was a whole genre of uh, photography of taking photographs of the dead child to have a memory of that child. So on the left hand side, we see a little boy. Uh, his eyes are, are actually closed. The pupils have been painted on his eyelids and then the photograph has been taken to sort of give an impression of what he looked like when he was alive. The little girl on the right. She's been surrounded by her little family of dollies uh, to give her some comfort. Uh, here's another image, a much more stylized one, but again from that, um, uh, that, that era of photographing uh, kids after their death. The little girl, she's died. Metaphorically, the drapes that are around her, the light of the drapes are taking her up to heaven whilst her father sits on by her bedside. A whole era and, of photography that we don't see anymore thank heavens but it was incredibly popular so obviously the wrong word isn't it it wasn't popular but it was uh, very frequent in the victorian era so as we go through the deck what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to try and pause a little bit on key photographers from each era so th this is my first one i want to have a look at a few photographs by julia margaret cameron uh, she came to photography quite late in her life uh, but um, was incredibly influential. She was a wonderful photographer. Uh, she uh, is quite interesting just to always quote a little bit from, uh, from different eras. You get a sense of uh, their language. Here's what uh, Julia Margaret Cameron said about photography. She said, my aspirations are to ennoble photography and to secure for it the character and uses of high art by combining the real and ideal and sacrificing nothing of truth by all possible devotion to poetry and beauty. Wow, wonderful Victorian, florid um, uh, language, of course. But it, it does capture her uh, intellectual approach to photography, which was that ph photography was an art form and you could do anything to a photograph that you might do to any other work of art to, to give it that, um, that status of high art. So let's have a couple, look at a couple of her pictures. So this one is uh, titled Iago, studied from an Italian 1867. So we're barely, what, 30 years into the history of photography. And they come out and, she, and Cameron comes out with an image like this. I have to say, I, I think this image is absolutely fantastic. I would be proud to do an image like this nowadays. Um, I think it has a modern uh, feel to it. Uh, and that's partly because... There's, there's, um, there's, a, there's, quite, there's a very narrow depth of focus. There's a little bit of blur in it. 
there are quite a lot of uh, marks on the photograph. She was quite well known for scratching and, and manipulating her photographs and the negatives on them to, to create effects on the photograph. And then I think also this has an in, a very interesting emotional feel to it. So uh, we know it's of Iago, Iago who, who of course is a character from Othello. You'll all remember that in the play Othello is the general and Iago is, his, um, is one of his subordinates who is jealous of Othello, particularly of his position, but also of his marriage to Desdemona. And he um, uh, contrives to sow the seeds of doubt in Othello about Desdemona's, Desdemona, Othello and Desdemona are married. And he contrives to sow the seeds of doubt in Othello's mind that his wife is faithful. He tricks Othello. And Othello is so tricked that ultimately he uh, kills uh, his wife Desdemona and then he, he kills himself. Iago is responsible for all of that. And what we have here is a study of a man contemplating either what he is about to do or what he has just done. Now, now we think of that, look into this man's face. First of all, a very beautiful man. I think we'd all, we'd all see that. But the downcast eyes, the, the thought that is clearly going through it. This looks like a man who is contemplating these things. And I think to have that emotional context coming back at us as viewers is a stroke of genius by uh, Cameron. Where is the information coming from? Well, I think it's very much from his downward gaze uh, and the full-on portrait uh, that, that Cameron has done. So this is a combination of the actor acting and the photographer recording the image. Let's have a look at another one. Here is um, Cameron's picture of her niece. So she used to get her family to act out for her the roles that she wanted to, them to play. Uh, and this particular uh, uh, image is called Beatrice. And it comes, the background is a play uh, by Percy Bysshe Shelley called The Sensi. Uh, which was based on a true story. So Beatrice uh, plotted with her stepmother and older brother to kill their tyrannical father, the Count Francesco Sensi. They had him murdered, and after the murder, all three were then executed in 59. So uh, 1599, a true story. Now let's have a look at the photograph. Photograph, what do we see? Again, we see uh, a girl, She's her eyes are downcast, the head is tilted. She looks like she is contemplating her fate. Uh, to me, uh, the sense that I get out of it, the uh, the sense of mystery around it is also heightened by the very narrow depth of field. All that foreground hair at the bottom has gone out of, out of uh, focus. The uh, sort of cap that she's got on, the the, uh, uh, the the hat that she's got on again goes out of focus uh, very quickly, allowing us to focus on the eyes. The eyes being the window to the soul we are looking directly into her soul and we see the thoughts that this woman, um, Beatrice, is thinking at this moment. I think that, that's fascinating. Here's a portrait uh, that um, Cameron took of, of one of the eminent um, um, scientists of the day. She was friends with um, uh, Herschel, Sir John Herschel. Herschel was uh, very famous at the time. He was considered to be a great scientist the arrival of Isaac Newton, the discoverer of um, Uranus, the planet, of uh, an amazing mathematician, also a personal friend of Cameron. But look how she's photographed. She hasn't done a sort of uh, a, a staid portrait of, uh, of a famous figure in Victorian um, uh, heritage. What she's done is she's created this face looming out of the dark it's coming towards you the light is just picking up the features very strong chiaroscuro across the face light and dark the background is dark the hair is disheveled i think she actually disheveled his hair for the photograph uh, he looks like an old testament prophet and that's all cameron she's created this this image of herschel um, to suggest that he is as important, as wise as a prophet from the Bible. Fascinating photograph. Um, here's the last one by Cameron. This is of um, the model, um, uh, uh, um, Alice Liddell. Um, the, the main photograph there is called Pomona. So this is, uh, Pomona was the goddess of fruit trees, orchards, the goddess of gardens. 
here we have um, Alice surrounded by uh, the, the foliage, etc. She's quite an interesting model because she was also the model in the, the small photograph as a child. That's the, the famous picture by um, Lewis Carroll. And Alice Little is the, um, the inspiration between his books uh, on Alice through the looking glass and, uh, and so on and so forth. So she, was, uh, she moved in these circles as well. Okay, so let's come to our second chapter then. We'll have a look at portraiture and family. So if we come towards the end of the 19th century, there was a revolution in photography which was as important as, say, the mobile phone photography revolution has been in the last 20 years. And that was the invention of small, easily usable cameras and particularly the box brownie. And what we've got here is um, uh, uh, George Eastman travelling across the... Uh, Atlantic and he's coming to the to Europe to show off the first box brownie that's why the 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 image is circular the very first box brownie gave circular images the box brownie two then went to uh, rectangular images and the important thing about this particular camera was that it was so easy to use so these are um, advertisements from the day of the box brownie revolution and the the great thing about Kodak and the success of Kodak, the, the reason that Kodak, Kodak was so successful was they made photography easy. So the, the famous slogan was, you press the button, we do the rest. And what that meant was, you took the image with your box brownie, you sent your box brownie off to uh, Kodak, they would then take the film out, they'd process the film, they'd print your prints for you, they'd load your camera back up with the film, and they'd send the whole lot back to you, and it cost $2. Uh, and that was it. So everyone could use these, and it's quite interesting to look at who has been featured on these uh, uh, adverts. This is not uh, advertising to, say, the camera club clientele of the day. This is being advertised to young ladies, mums. As you can see on the left-hand one, it says, this can be operated by any schoolboy or girl. It was for everyone. Photography suddenly became ubiquitous, and people just started to take photographs of their family. So here is a, an example, admittedly this is not a box brownie photograph, but it's a wonderful photographer of the family that comes from this era. era the Parisian, uh, French Parisian Jacques-Henri Lartigue. I can't recommend highly enough that you, you go and have a look at Lartigue's photographs. They are wonderful. Lartigue came from a um, uh, quite a well-off family in uh, France. Uh, he was given a camera quite early on in his life. And what did he do with it? He trained it on his family. And he took photographs of the family. So this is his cousin, Bichonard, and he has asked his cousin to leap down the stairs outside their family home. And wow, she's done it. And what a fantastic photograph you've got. It's got all the joy and the excitement and the liveliness of what their family life must have been like. And he's captured it in 1905, a wonderful photograph. Here's another couple of his, uh, he must have thought of these as family snapshots, but uh, they're, so, they're so much more than that. Here's Zizou, his brother, uh, who has gone swimming in the local piscine, uh, and it looks like he was ex certainly an eccentric character, to say the least, because he decided to go swimming without taking his clothes off, and he's gone swimming in lo what looks like he's about to go off on a sort of explorer's trip to Africa or something, and he's even got a tie on there. So Zizou, his brother, must have been quite a quite a character. On the right hand side, the vertical panorama, you've got the photographs that we all love to take of our kids, our kids having fun. And here's Lartigue taking photographs in the 1920s of his kids jumping over sand castles. Lartigue was married three times in his life, uh, each time to an extremely beautiful woman uh, who, whom he photographed all the time. Here's an example of one of them, Renee, <clears throat> married in uh, 1930 uh, and a wonderful photograph that shows you know her slinky figure and that beautiful hat that goes around and frames her face a uh, fantastic figure that, that exudes the fashion of expensive uh, parisian well-off families um, in the 1930s well I'm, i i i said earlier on that uh, I guess my uh, forte is landscape and architecture. But of course I do photograph uh, in and around the family uh, very much. And uh, my next door neighbors know that I'm a photographer. So when they had a baby, of course I was roped in uh, to take a photograph. And 
so here's uh, one of mine. Um, I admit straight off that I think this is probably quite a cliche image. To juxtapose the thighs of the baby with size of dad is the sort of photograph uh, that we'd all take. But it, it's a cliche because it works. I mean, it, it makes a really, really touching photograph. Is it the sort of photograph that would win any competitions? No, it's not. But is it the photograph that they've got a massive print on, they put it on their wall? Yes, it is. Uh, uh, and that's one of the areas that portrait photography uh, can be really, really effective. So we'll just have a quick run through some of my family snaps. Here's some of the things that we use our portrait photography for. It's, it's for memorializing our kids. Now this little girl doesn't have, she's not my kid, um, my daughter was in the troupe, she's in the background somewhere there, uh, but it was the local dance show, the kids were putting on a show, and of course I'm there with my camera to take photographs, and it helps to create memories, important memories, um, uh, of the family and, uh, and what the family do. So we memorialise our, our, um, our, our past with our children, particularly through portrait photography. Um, here's a little series that I've got called a Sunday lunch. Um, I have, um, uh, well, I normally shoot, I guess my most, well, I guess my most common camera is my phone. But uh, apart from that, I usually shoot a Sony. Uh, and, uh, but the Sony isn't really good. It's a, um, a mirrorless camera, big lens on the front. It's a really bad camera to have for these sorts of relatively intimate moments like a Sunday lunch. So I have a different camera that I use for that. I have a, a Leica, a Leica M9, which I use quite a lot. And the, the thing about the Leica, which is really good, is that it's unobtrusive. I can take photographs where it doesn't feel like I'm shoving a massive lens into the scene. So these are all, these little series of photographs we're gonna look at here all come from a Sunday lunch. And what I like about these sorts of photographs is that I feel that I'm unobtrusive. I'm just dropping in on the, the moment, as it were, and observing, and I think that works really well. So here's my son looking at something off stage uh, right. Here's my niece, again, at Sunday lunch. Again, this isn't gonna win any uh, trophies at a, a, um, a club competition. If you look really closely at it, you can start to pick it apart. The focus, for instance, particularly the uh, Leica, it's all manual focus. Uh, I've managed to focus on her back eye, not her front eye. But I don't really mind. I think actually it still works. It captures a very happy, gentle, um, soft moment, which I, I think works very well. Uh, here's another one. I would definitely say I would never put this into a competition. Yet, but I think it captures the emotion of the moment really well. It's granddad and granddaughter. And I know it's got lots of blur in it. I know it's got movement in it. Um, uh, I think that's because the light was relatively low. I must have been on a relatively slow shutter speed, so there's, there's movement. Uh, but I don't care about that. I think actually what I've caught here is a moment of rather nice, pleasant, warm emotion between the two of them. The eye contact that they have with each other makes the image work. The smiles therefore back it all up. I rather like the softness of her face, with the lines in his face, all of that sort of stuff makes this quite a... Um, a touching photograph. Here's another one that's my mother-in-law in the background and the out of focus um, lady in the front is my wife and again it's, it's an observed moment we're sort of dropping in on them just seeing uh, almost as if we're I, the word I was going to use the word spying that's probably the wrong word but we are we're eavesdropping on what is going on in the situation which I think works really well. Here's a quieter moment after lunch, my uh, daughter and my wife, my daughter uh, deciding that enough is enough. So that was, that was uh, an example of dropping in. Here's a, a different example. These are... Was that a question? Sorry, uh, uh, there was a... I think it's... Can you all hear me still? Yeah, I think it's just yeah. uh, bright up. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll carry on. Look, if, there's, if there is any problem, just stop me. We can always go back. So yeah, what sure. I was going to make with this is, whereas in the previous images, I've been sort of eavesdropping and taking slightly surreptitious photographs and portraits. This one is the opposite. Here I was taking photographs of my son. And as you can see, my son had really decided that he'd had enough and he didn't really want me to photograph him anymore. 
And I think on the left, you get a sense of, uh, he's actually tossing his head back and he's, he, I remember quite well, he was saying to me, oh God, not another one, Dad. Um, but that's, a, you don't quite get that, but you certainly get that when you look at his eyes on the right hand side and the set of his mouth, you begin to see that he's had enough and you can feel that coming through. And that's, that's interesting because that means that he, it is his uh, thought pattern that is coming through to us through the photograph. And that's what we're interpreting as we look at, at it from our side as a viewer. And I rather like that. It means that the meaning is coming from the model rather than anything I'm trying to art direct or whatever. This is a different set. This is um, uh, pictures of my mum and dad. My, my mum had a stroke um, well, about 10 years before she actually died, but she became quite incapacitated and had to be taken care of by my dad. Uh, and uh, of course I used to visit a lot and, uh, and I would go up. And this again was an ideal place for the Leica, not for the big Sony, um, because I, it, it, it was a, an eavesdropping moment. I would capture photographs uh, which were quiet in tone. And this is a good example. Now, is this a portrait, I would ask, first of all? Well, to me, it is. I mean, it tells me, not strictly speaking, because it's not facial, but uh, it does tell me a lot about the relationship between my mother and my father. So the wedding ring is, is clearly symbolic of that. Uh, you can get a sense of the age of them. You can see the... Um, little patches on the back of my mum's hand. Uh, you can see how they cleave to one another. They're clasping one another. The relationship was very close. Uh, and I think all of that, that emotional content comes through. Now, it's particularly emotional for me because I'm related to them. But I think in this particular photograph, which I would class as a, almost as a portrait, I think it works as well. I think that comes through quite strongly. Here's another photograph. This is uh, perhaps a slightly broader view. You can see my dad and my mum. You can see how my mum there, she's got her fist clenched. Her uh, left hand um, is, you can see the effect of the stroke in that. But you can see the relationship between them. You can see the, the emotional hook uh, that comes in. So a double portrait here that represents their relationship. This is another one, again, um, the, very much a Leica photograph, if ever. Uh, it has all those aspects of Leica about it, very shallow focus. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. But again, it, 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 it's got in close. I don't think you, can, you just can't take these photographs with big clunky, clattery uh, DSLR. This is a place for um, uh, a smaller camera. And it works quite well here. And I think this portrait uh, of my mum and dad, again, uh, it, to me, certainly, it captures the relationship and the emotional intensity uh, of that relationship uh, towards the end of my mum's life. Okay, to, to lighten the mood uh, just a little bit, here is completely different family portrait. So this is, again, this is me struggling with my uh, flash photography. So I'm using my one, uh, one light off to the camera right over my top of my shoulder, uh, and then just a little bit of bounce back of light onto the, the, the left-hand side, and I'm trying to, to capture more standard studio-style portraits, which are, uh, are more fun in nature. Okay, so let's come to the modern age. And what I mean by the modern age is the period between the wars. The First World War was so important in many ways, but particularly because it ushered in the machine era. Uh, on the battlefield, that was represented, of course, by the machine gun. And then as uh, the war faded away, uh, the, the, the move towards... Uh, machines just gathered pace uh, and there was a, hu a period of huge um, political, social, intellectual upheaval. It's the period that we associate with all the isms, surrealism, Dadaism, futurism, cubism, vorticism, constructivism, all these things. These were the theoretical, uh, intellectual melting pot of the time. And the way that photography was made changed. It changed because of the cameras that were available and the techniques changed as well. And here's a classic example. This is from a, a very famous uh, photo um, exhibition which was held in Stuttgart in 1929. Um, massive thing brought together uh, photographers uh, all over Europe, the Soviet Union, and the US. But look at the actual photograph. This is not a photograph 
that Julia Margaret Cameron would ever have taken. Someone is shooting straight up, looking up the legs, up to the face of man. It absolutely reeks change, new, different, modern. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at very quickly. So a key phot photographic um, example of that would be Rodchenko, Alexander Rodchenko, Russian, lived 1891 to 1956. He is classically associated with what is known as constructivism. The idea is that art is no longer about representing the inner life. That was Julian Margaret Cameron. Uh, life, uh, uh, photography and art is constructed. It is all about social purposes, meaning is projected onto what is being seen rather than coming from it. So when you look at Pioneer Girl here uh, in 1930, the onus is on you as the viewer to decide what you are seeing here. Well, what I see when I look at this girl is a girl, she looks like um, uh, she is uh, uh, very, very dedicated to the Soviet Union. She is part of the idealism of youth and the, uh, 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 and the um, communist ideology. And Rodchenko's way of photographing, looking up at her, having her look out at the images, all designed to create that meaning in the viewer. Uh, here's another uh, classic photo by Rodchenko. This is of a, a chap called Osip Brick in 1924. Brick was a friend of uh, Rodchenko's. I don't think you'd even get that from the image. Um, I mentioned earlier, uh, particularly when looking at Cameron, uh, that phrase, that cliche that we hear, hear it all the time, uh, eyes are a window to the soul. Have a look at Mr. Brick's eyes. Are they a window into his soul? Can you tell what Mr. Brick is thinking right now? I don't think you can. I think it's almost impossible to know what Brick is thinking. Eyes are not the window to the soul here. This is not us looking into his inner life. This is us looking at a reflection of this man. Uh, he is highly intellectual. You get that from the round rims, the cropped hair. Look at the, the, the glasses, the words, the letters that are on there in Cyrillic script. Spell L-E-F, Lef, which is short for Levy Front Iskups, which is the left front of the arts. All of that is to suggest that this modern era in Russia uh, of a communism is, uh, is working class, it's moving forward, it's idealistic, and all of that is reflected back. But it's up to us as viewers to take that from the image. It's not coming from the image itself. We're not looking into this man's inner life. Here's um, Osip Brick's wife, Lilia Brick, very famous photograph of her. She was known as the muse of the Soviet avant-garde, so said Paul Neruda, the poet. Uh, and look again at the way that this has been photographed, completely different, very different style, uh, very different uh, technique from what we've noticed earlier in the Victorian period. Massively influential, uh, the idea that you that you can move the camera into these odd angles, very, very uh, associated with the time and hugely influential. So here we have on the left, how that image was actually used in some of the advertising material of the time. She's shouting Knigi, which is Russian for books. Uh, and, and you can see that the, the image, that, that way that that image has been used is still being used now. This is a direct uh, uh, line through to the modern day with an album cover for a band called Franz Ferdinand, who some of you may or may not know, a uh, very modern band. And, and these, these sorts of images are very powerful. They, they still are run on through common society nowadays. If we leave Russia and we go across to Paris, which of course was another ferment pot of the arts, uh, we have some of the most famous photographers uh, ever were working in Paris at the time in the late 20s and the early 30s. Here's a picture by Man Ray. This is a surrealist picture uh, called Black and White. Again, overloaded with meaning, but not about the inner life of the model or the character. We can't tell anything about uh, the picture of, uh, of the actual person who's being photographed in this portrait. Quite ironic that it's called Black and White when the actual image is white and black. Uh, the girl is white, the mask is black. We would read it that way around, I guess. Uh, so there's that inversion going on there. There's a juxtaposition between the 
slickness of the uh, model, the sophistication of European culture being juxtaposed with an African black mask. We may find that rather racist nowadays, but that's what's behind the image uh, there. Man Ray was uh, a really well-known artist. Some of his photographs uh, were in their day the most expensive photographs ever sold. This one went for around about, uh, I think, $2.7 million at, at one stage, uh, um, 20 years ago or so in, a, in an auction. It's a famous photograph called Glass Tears. I'm sure you've all seen this one before. I've often worried, wondered about this. I never quite understood what the glass tears were for. But as I was uh, uh, reading up about this, I found out that actually that this is, this is to do with what was going on in Man Ray's uh, private life at the time. He, he had been in a relationship with another photographer called Lee Miller, uh, who had quit him and dumped him, literally dumped him just before this photograph was taken. So these glass tears are the tears are like crocodile tears. They're, they're the tears that aren't real, that represent the relationship uh, that had not been real. They were a revenge on the lover who had left him. Some of the other famous photographers of the day, well, lots of them taking portraits in Paris. Here is Andre Cortez, another wonderful photographer. This one's called Satiric Dancer. Um, he was photographing a, a, a model called Magda, Magna Firstner, who was a dancer and an actress. And he said to her, uh, do something with the spirit of the studio. And she started to move on the sofa. She just made a movement. I only took two photographs. People in motion are wonderful to photograph. It means catching the right moment, the moment when something changes into something else. Well, what has changed here and what is, what is being photographed? Well, we've got the, the fantastically supple young Magda Firstner who's slinkily lying all over the sofa. But of course the picture works because of the juxtaposition with everything else that's in the picture. So first of all, you've got the torso, the male torso on the left hand side that is also twisted. And then at the top right, you've got the picture of um, what looks like a, um, a sort of a prehistoric figurine of a woman, uh, um, uh, naked on the wall there and there's uh, the, the dancer and the, the picture works because she decided to create the, the echo of these shapes so it's her picture really she's given it to Cortez all Cortez had to do was photograph it at the right moment to capture everything so you could question her I mean there is certainly a an equal partnership going on in the creation of an image like this here are some other uh, famous uh, photographs from Paris in, in the 30s. These are by uh, a wonderful photographer called Brassai, who is known for his pictures of Paris by night. That's his famous book, highly worthwhile seeking out if you can get hold of it, a copy. On the left, we've got uh, these are both observed photographs, a little bit like my Sunday lunch portfolio, although slightly more risque, I suppose. Lovers in a small cafe on the left-hand side. Uh, Fat Claude and her girlfriend, at Le Monoc on the uh, right hand side of famous um, a homosexual cafe hangout uh, that was photographed in 1932. And then we come into the 30s. Here's a, a, a classic example of a surrealist photograph by a photographer called Herbert Beyer called Humanly Impossible. The picture, of course, shows a bloke who's managed to cut his arm in half. So we all see that. But then you look at his face and you go, what is it that he's actually, you would imagine if someone had cut his arm off, uh, he would be writhing around and shocked in pain. But that's not actually what seems to be going on here. The, the man's shock, the model's shock, is actually a shock because he's looking at his reflection rather than at his arm. It's a very, dis it's a weird estrangement style uh, picture. Uh, it, it, it's very odd as you look into it and that it's an example of the surrealist aesthetic of exploring the subconscious, the meaning of dreams, the uncanny. It's a very odd photograph uh, and quite weird. So I rather like uh, doing some different techniques with my camera as well. Here's one of the things I do. I mean, I must admit, I, I do manage to get my camera off kilter sometimes and, uh, and go for good old wonky horizon like I've got here. But uh, this was uh, an example of a photograph. I was, uh, I was asked to photograph a wedding a while ago. 
And uh, towards the end of the evening, everyone's relaxing, everyone's dancing, and uh, I was still on duty as a photographer. Uh, and so I thought I would try a few different techniques out. So this one is taken, uh, the way this has been taken is to take my camera, uh, put it on a slightly longer exposure, I think about a second manual exposure of a second or manual, uh, yeah, exposure of a second. And then I've got my flash gun on top of the camera and I set that to go off during the exposure. So what I do is I twist my camera, I twist it on its barrel axis, I turn it around like that. So the camera is moving during the exposure and the flash goes off. And what I get is a combination of sharp and blur. And in this case, the flash has frozen the girl as she's dancing in front of me, but allowed everything else to blur. So there's a light that I guess was originally uh, on the left-hand side of the image. And as I've turned the camera, I've probably turning it anti-clockwise and that has zipped the, the light through the image. And to me, I think this gives quite a, a strong sense of what the emotional context of a dance is like. I think it, it, it manages to represent through all this blur and this light and this uh, rather odd um, uh, light that you've got in it, the joy of dancing. Here's the same technique being used, uh, same uh, um, time. Um, so I was um, uh, photographing uh, the couple and uh, not the wedding couple, but a different couple and uh, they clinched in an embrace and I've spun my camera as I've taken a photograph of them. And I think, again, that this captures something of the delirium of a slightly drunken snog at a party. And I rather <laughs> like that. Uh, and I think uh, the, the blurring of everything adds to it, the light streaks add to it, and it adds to that emotional content. Now, I have put this one into competition. And of course, the judge didn't like it at all because they went, what is that big white smudge at the back? I don't like this at all. I think it scored a really crap mark. But uh, hey, hey, you just have to roll, rock and roll with it and roll with the punches. <laughs> it didn't work. But to me, uh, to me it worked, uh, to the judge. I can't remember who the judge was. And if right. I could, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> <Frontier, yeah. laughs> uh, here's another one. This is a slightly more recent one taken with my, my phone. My daughter was having a party. Uh, I think it was her 18th party. Anyway, the, the, the house was rammed full of teenagers. We happen to have a, a door in the, in the house that is translucent like this. So uh, the kids, they were moving behind it and I could, see, I could see them creating all these wonderful patterns. So I asked a couple of them if they would mind posing up against the door, let them pose in whatever they, way they wanted. And I snapped away with my, my phone. And I got these rather interesting portrait shots and uh to me again that they're, they're a little bit different they're not your run of the mill um but they capture a little bit about the um the fun of a party of a teenage party which i liked uh, a little bit oh here's my first selfie look at that uh so the selfie has become so ubiquitous i had to chuck a couple of them in the deck so uh, here's the first one of me, <laughs> me excuse me <coughs> i had just been i'd be i think i'd been pressure washing the patio, not very well. And uh, I had managed to splatter myself uh, with mud. So um, I thought, when I looked at myself, I, uh, I thought, oh my God, I look absolutely ridiculous. But uh, I thought I might as well take a photograph of myself. Here's a slightly more, uh, well, at least I'm cleaner in this. Um, well, yes. Can I just say, what you should have said is you just finished an Iron Man there. That's what you thought <laughs> Oh God, if only I could do that. That would that that'll be the day. <laughs> I think my days of Iron Man they're well over. Uh, yes, but I do look a bit like that. I've just been through this one. There's one. You know, who, who was saying they're from Abridge? Isn't there one just outside Abridge called the Mud Plucker or something? Not you know something that? that I've done, Tom. Sorry, not something that I've done. Ah, okay. Well, I'd love to go and photograph that sometime. We should we should look out for that. Yeah. Uh, I Here's me with a slightly more um, uh, studio type shot with the light obviously set up on the, on my right, on the right hand side of the image to give the shadow as well. Okay, one more section then we'll take our break. Uh, this is all about social documentary. So um, I want to have a quick look at uh, another key photographer. This is uh, August Zander who lived from 1876 to 1964, a fantastic photographer of people. 
Uh, this is uh, one of his early pictures taken in 1914, so just before the, uh, the First World War. Uh, Zander was, uh, his intention was to make a record of all the, um, of the people in the German speaking areas and categorize them according to their station, according to their work, etc., etc. And I never got to finish his, um, his project. Uh, how many of us do finish our projects? I never do. Um, uh, but he did publish a set of 60, uh, which he called The Face of a Time, which is a, a, a wonderful uh, photograph. And he organized in it um, everyone according to occupational social types. Now, you would think that that would be something that might have even appealed to the Nazis, but it didn't. And the reason it didn't was because the individuality of the characters within these social types always um, shines through. And in fact, Zander got um, heavily persecuted by the Nazis during, during the Nazi um, uh, dictatorship. Let's have a look at a couple of his photographs. This one is from 1941. This is a heavily metaphorical uh, image. It's when you read about the analysis of it, uh, quite often you hear that uh, the, the, the way these young farmers, they, they're obviously, clearly they're going off uh, to a celebration. It looks like it's a Sunday afternoon. They're probably going to the local fete. They've got dressed up and yet they come to a standstill. And the metaphor that is usually associated with, with that runs from the right to the left, uh, from the left to the right, sorry. So you've got the young chap on the left. He's moving forward. His walking stick is still at an angle. He's moving through the image. He's come to a, a standstill by the middle and a juddering halt by the right. And, and it's symbolic of uh, the moment in European history where everything was about uh, to change. Let's have a look at a slightly later one. This is um, uh, called Young Mother, Middle Class Mother, 1926. I love this image. I think this has so much on it on a personal level, but also a metaphorical level. So on a personal level, it's a picture of a mum with her kid and their pet. And it looks like a family snap like that. He's done well to get down to her level. Look at the joy in the little kid's face. He, the, the, the little child looks like all little children does, full of hope, full of joy, full of uh, the vigour and the vim of life, hoping uh, with that apple in his hand and then look at the mum and bear in mind this is a photograph taken in 1926 so we're slap bang in the middle of the uh, Weimar Republic very difficult time in Germany hyperinflation has just happened uh, savings gone out the window very difficult time the rise of uh, the far right has begun uh, and look into her eyes and then tell me whether she's looking into the future does she look worried is she anxious about the future i guess all mothers are anxious about the future for their children but you look into her eyes uh, and i think you see trouble coming down uh, the path uh, which is uh, a fascinating aspect fascinating meaning to project onto that image now we can debate obviously she didn't know what was coming in the future in 1926 we look at it uh, through our eyes in now 2020 but we can't help but project onto that. So in this sense, meaning is definitely coming from the viewer and may be contained uh, in, the, uh, in the, the person being photographed. Here's another one um, by Zander, The Notary, 1924. Uh, this is, uh, again, um, uh, this is not really about the inner life of the character, but it reveals much about the situation at the time. So we have a chap, he's clearly uh, an important chap, worked in a, uh, as a, a notary, as a sort of um, uh, official capacity. And then you look at him and you can see that he wants to maintain that social standing. You can see that in the dog he's got with him, the Doberman, the hat that he's got on. But then look at his coat. It's slightly threadbare. It's seen better days. It's lost the odd button. It's a bit frayed. A man who is trying to keep up appearances, but not quite managing it uh, it's a picture about a better past a precarious present wonderful images uh, of, uh, of people and uh, trying to focus on what they can keep alive at any given moment okay we're in the period of social documentary so we need to zip over to america and have a look at some of the famous american photographers of this time here's perhaps 
one of the most famous social documentary photographs ever known, which is Migrant Mother by Dorothea Lange. Uh, this is a picture taken during the uh, Depression in, um, in America. Uh, Dorothea Lang was on assignment for the Farm Security Administration, the FSA, which was meant to document what was going on, particularly in the West, in California. Uh, the mom herself, she is Florence Owens Thompson. She had seven kids, three of whom we can see on this picture because it's the little baby. Everyone forgets the baby down at the bottom of the picture. And I wonder whether when we look at this uh, sort of portrait, whether... We see the individual, of course, we see her anxiety, her worry about the future for her children, but she's almost become like um, a leitmotif or an icon for a whole period. She's, uh, she has a sort of Madonna-like uh, sense to her uh, with that hand that's just cupping her chin. Uh, she's the quintessence of anxiety and worry and nervousness as she looks after her kids. And of course, the fact that they're all looking away heightens the pathos of the image. Here's another picture taken at the time by another great photographer, Walker Evans, 1936, Alabama tenant farmer wife. This is a picture of Ali Mae Burroughs, who was a young woman, although you wouldn't think of it actually to look at her, she doesn't look young, but she was, uh, uh, caught in the, uh, the depression uh, outside her home. Um, Walker Evans photographed her against the wall of her house. When you look into her face, you see, you see the difficulty of the time. You see the, the poverty and the hardship of life for cotton farmers in Alabama. And I think that is accentuated by the comparison between her weather-lined face with its lines around the eyes and the lines of the boards of her house behind her. They, they seem to echo each other. And her thin cotton dress, so flimsy, uh, and clearly poverty stream. There's a lot of psychology going on in this image, which I think uh, uh, shows us a lot about the, the difficulty of life in 1936 Alabama. Now I take, I have taken quite a lot of photographs. I set myself a, a challenge to go and photograph up and down Epping High Street, all the, um, the people who were working on the high street. So I started in the butcher's shop and here is a picture of John the butcher in Epping and like this photograph I think uh, it, it, it reflects very much what John is like he's got a big hunk of beef on his shoulder uh, and that represents him as a man uh, very much we're in the cold room there he's moving into the storage room uh, and, and, and here we have uh, him as a butcher now he's evidently a butcher this is his colleague Kyle uh, and I think also this to me also captures both the individual car, but also the, the butcheriness of being a butcher. And I think that comes from his clothes. So the fact that he's got the, the famous striped apron on, the tie slightly undone, top button undone, that speaks to his profession and his character. And then you've got his face, good looking man, um, with his quiff of hair at the top. Kyle, unfortunately, uh, he, he, he suffered greatly. He uh, got an illness shortly after these photographs were taken and died, uh, which is a great shame. Uh, so these photographs were, um, well, I was sort of lucky that I'd taken them and I gave him a whole set of photographs to his um, wife. He died, unfortunately died of um, pneumonia very, very early in life. Here's another one from the series. This is from the dry cleaners up the road where my wife drops, drops off an awful lot of clothing. Uh, so I didn't feel any any um, pain at all at going in and asking about taking some photographs, given how much money we spent there. And here is, uh, I like this photograph, I like the swoop of the, the steaming iron. I think it gives a great feeling of flow through the image, which works uh, really well as the chap is about to iron the shirt. Here's another one. This is from Camden Market. Uh, I have, uh, I'm quite uh, fearless about asking people if they would mind posing. And, and I find on the whole... The people don't mind at all. Uh, if someone does mind, then you just shrug your shoulders and walk away. But the vast majority of people are very happy to do so. This was a young lady. She was about to fill her large pan with paella for the lunchtime customers. Um, and I asked her if she would mind posing. And she gave me this. She sort of squatted down and looked at me and bang, off went the camera. And I think that's, again, it's really interesting thing about um, 
just watching what people do and allowing them to do it. Uh, and quite often they give you pictures. And this one was given to me. Here's uh, a couple of, oh, you might recognize some of these photos. Uh, yeah. They probably come up in, um, in competition with, uh, with you guys at age two. So you'll know Paul Mee's photograph closer than you think. Uh, uh, Paul is a, an excellent photographer, particularly a sort of street uh, photography. And here's his one. And again, this, this photograph works so well because of the juxtaposition, the juxtaposition between the two gents in the background who are oblivious uh, to the poverty that is literally outside their door. So this is a, a portrait of a street portrait par excellence. Um, the uh, um, being a sort of very keen photographer, I can't resist it if I hear something going on. And I was uh, wandering through London. Uh, um, in 2017, and I could hear all these whistles going off. I went, mean, what on earth is all this noise? It was a pretty drizzly, dreek, horrible day. And I could hear whistles going off all over the place. So, of course, I went to investigate. And lo and behold, I found out that every year there is a naked bike demonstration where a whole load of people take their kit off and cycle through the centre of London. And here's one of my images for it, uh, from it. So um, again, I like this one. Uh, I like this one not only because she's a pretty girl, which she is, of course, but I like it because it's off kilter. I love the diagonals of it. I love the splatter of paint all over it. I like the fact she's got it on her cheek. The blue of the whistle contrasts nicely with the red of her lipstick. And it all works to me in terms of it captures the emotion. Uh, if this one is for the gents, the ladies should not be without their own image. So here's another chap, a young buff, buff chap who decided he was going to cover himself in gold paint. Um, uh, and hey, presto, off he did just before he jumped on his bike. I would ask you all to direct your attention to him. Don't look into the back where you might, if you are unlucky, catch a sight of a naked Father Christmas. Uh, not quite as glorious at all. Uh, so here's my last photograph before the break. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> just to just to summarise that a, a portrait doesn't need to be uh, taken in front of a person; it can easily be taken behind a person as well. And we'll just I'll stop sharing the images there, just in case I'm shocking you too much. And if anyone's got any questions, then you can. Um, you can chuck them out to me now, or otherwise you can uh, dash off to get yourself a refreshment before we do the Just going to wash my eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thanks very much, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Tom, did you use the Leica for the shots in Epping High Street, the uh, the traders? No, I didn't. I used my uh, my Sony. All oh, right. It was a Sony shot. It was my it was a Sony before the current one. It was. Um, what was it? Uh, an Alpha 99, I think it's called, the A99. I've got it as my backup camera now. Um, yeah, we'll see. It's the A73 you've got for the Sony. I do, that's the one I use, uh, use all the time now, the A73, yeah. Have you got many lenses for the uh, M9? Two. I've got a portrait lens, 90mm, and I've got um, a wide angle of 35. 35, yeah, the classic street lens. Yeah, I would love to be able to afford the 50mm Noctilux 0.95 yeah yeah until i have twelve thousand pounds spare <laughs> i'm not buying it <laughs> and i thought the canon stuff was expensive yeah. yes have you seen the uh, m10 the mono the monochrome one yeah i have I've, I've played with it a bit actually it's really nice i don't think I'm, personally i just i can't justify spending that amount of money on uh, on a monochrome only camera no um but it is really nice. I mean, if I had the money, I would, of course, uh, I would go and play. But uh, Have you seen the work of a young guy called Alan Schaller? No, I don't know him. Take down his name, S-C-H-A-L-L-E-R. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, hang on. Um, oh, I'll tell you what, uh, what what's the... I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah, do, yeah. please do. I, I love looking up uh, different photographers. It's, uh, it's, it's so pleasant to... Uh, to investigate a bit more and find out new photography. He's a he's a Leica he's a Leica ambassador. Oh yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. He's in his early thirties. He's only been shooting for five. He only picked up a camera five years ago. Yeah, that's amazing. His work is just he's already oh, he's already got that look that brand. People know that color shot. 
and he yeah. uses and he uses the M10. Yeah. The M10, I've got an M9. The M10 is the uh, is the latest version. Yeah. They are, they're, uh, I mean, I do quite. I do a talk on on Leica photography. Do you? I should come and do it to you guys. Actually, you, you it, did. Yeah. Oh, I have done it. Okay, so you've yeah, seen a couple, couple of years back now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I've got a Q. I've got oh, a have you? Yeah, that's a nice camera. Yeah, twenty eight. One point one point seven, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice, really. Yeah, I mean, very good for street photography. Yeah, it is. I was looking at a guy the other day called Professor Hines. That's his nickname. He's a, a black American New Yorker. Yeah. He shoots. He shoots street with a with a with a ninety uh, with an eighty five mil. Wow. Yeah. I've never seen anyone do before, but his work is is really superb. Yeah. 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 Very it, you know, I mean, it's it's a it's a good test to give yourself some time, which is to go to whatever your genre of photography is and take the wrong lens. Yeah, just because it makes you makes you take different photographs, you have to. Yeah, or just one lens. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good test as well. I um when I was uh, I did my um just before lockdown, we did our uh, one. Uh, how many trips have I done for Quest this year? I did one into the Lake District early on, and then we went to Iceland. And um, two of the guys in Iceland had brought along um, 100 to 400 mil lenses, which I've never, I, I've got one, never taken it to Iceland. It's bloody heavy. Mm. Um, so, but they got fantastic photographs. I'm going, oh my God, look at those photographs. They're, they're just so different. They're different, partly because obviously it's, it's the photographer, but also simply because of the optics make a difference to the image. So next time I go to Iceland, I'm taking my big lens. Yeah, that compression. I mean, the compression that you get with a long lens is quite stunning. Yeah. Often, often used in cinema. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't really associate the 100 to 400 with landscape photography, but it's fantastic for landscape it's good photography. For, good for isolating stuff, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Strong. You've got to carry that all day long. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Especially full format. I mean, if you're using micro four thirds or APS-C, it's a lot yeah. lighter. But if you're using a, a Canon or a Nikon it's, or a Sony, it's a pretty heavy piece of gear to you know carry around all day long. It is. It is definitely that. Yeah. But anyway, well, there you go. Oh, so so I get... Yeah, oh, sorry. You said, about, you said in the Victorian era about taking photographs of uh, dead babies. Uh, yeah. There's, there's a charity that still does that, they. Um, it's called remember my baby doll dot uk and uh, what they do is if um, people have got um had a stillbirth um they go and take photos for the for them as something to remember by yeah <laughs> which is exact that's exactly the same motivation isn't it yeah it's, it's I, I, I don't think i'd have the strength to do that myself but um yeah <laughs> you well, can in, the yeah, in the nikon in the nikon in nikyu um, they actually have the leaflets for them so that if anything does happen to your baby, um, they do ask you, would you like? And they, they've got a whole range of photographers who literally can go to the hospital within the drop of a hat to get there quickly and actually take the images. Wow. They'll also do a plaster cast of the hands and feet. Hands and feet, yeah. Yeah, yeah oh. I knew that. I, I, I knew about the plaster cast, but I didn't realise it was still photographed. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a really big... Um, uh, there, there's a... Uh, there, all the hospitals are all linked up to it. I think Kennedy does it. Or she was doing it. She did train to do that, to be able to go into hospitals. Who was that, Joe? So Kennedy. Oh, right. I she mean, that's, to that, the club. that must be quite a difficult thing to do. I mean, that must be. Mm. Oh, God, no way I could do that. Emotionally draining, I imagine. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. I think they also they do say that they feel that they are giving something back to the parents that they that those parents would never ever have. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how fascinating. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we were in uh, NICU for three months uh, at Addenbrooke's. So, of course, we saw uh, some of this going on. And 
um they they do take them to a little private room and it's all laid out nicely and um they've got special what they call um cold cots and the whereas normally the incubators are kept warm and um, these are actually kept cold uh to help preserve um the babies and until they can uh you know until the parents feel free to let them go yeah mm. yeah gosh yeah wow thank god that is few and far between nowadays and it's mm -hmm. one of the, the massive changes that we have versus say the victorian era. anyway there you go mm -hmm. cool have you got have you got a landscape lecture as well I do. I have, um, yeah, quite a good one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'll say so myself. <laughs> I'm looking, of, my, of my presentations, that's the one that I get most positive feedback about, is my landscape. Mm. I call it this, I call it, um, I think sometimes people get slightly put off by my titles, because I call it uh, uh, photography and the sublime. So I take the idea of the sublime, which is a, uh, an art history idea of uh, of landscape and i trace that through photography uh, start with land with pictures and then i take take it all the way through um uh, the Am great american tradition of uh, photography in the west uh, through various themes like uh, mountains ice water snow um then i go uh, and show um, and I do it in slightly the same way as this. I, I do lots of famous photographs and then I intersperse it with my own. Um, so, and then we go into um, what has happened to the idea of the sublime today. So the idea is now it's fractured into, you know, industrial sublime, suburban sublime, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we have a look at a lot of those. We look at some of the pictures that might... Um, uh, that you a lot of pictures you will know some you won't know some of them you'll like some of them you won't like and they're the ones that are really interesting because they create a lot of uh, um, uh, conversation around it and then I end up by saying okay so we're now going to go into the future what will the sublime look like in the future and I go way off into some really quite um, different photographs some esoteric photographs take us way into space look at space photography and uh and some other art photography which is just stunning um uh and then that's it and that's my my journey through the sublime because the uh, the image of the migrant mother yeah isn't what it is portrayed to be is it in what sense well, weren't um, they all traveling together sorry weren't they all traveling together and it's their friend or something they, they were traveling and she had a puncture or something happened to the car and it just stopped in this in this little village this little outpost and they, they were just all sitting around waiting uh for the car to be repaired and they snapped a photograph and did they she did quite a few photos of that and then um it all came out as this migrant mother. But they, there was a program on telly a little while ago, and they'd actually interviewed the woman, the woman when she was older. And yeah. she was saying, yes, she said, I was portrayed as this. But they were actually quite well off. She'd got her own car and everything. And yeah, it is true that um, I don't, know, I don't know that about. I'm sure that is true, but uh, um, the. The way that that photograph was used. So, for instance, the um, um, the person who it actually was, she was never credited with the photograph. It was uh, it, it was anonymous. Mm. So, so there was it was used as an a photographic icon uh, to represent what was going on in California at the time, as the the people were moving mm. westward to try and look for work, and it was called Migrant Mother, and it became very famous. Now. Whether or not that was the reality of, of exactly who that person was, I, I'm not sure, but, uh, but that's how it was used. I think there were seven photographs at the time. There's a, the, you, the contact sheet still exists of the actual photographs. Um, 
So it's an interesting one. We'll have to dig into the history of that photo photograph a bit more. You you saw that, did you, Jeff? Yeah, I've seen it somewhere. Um, whether someone come to the club and spoke about it. Yeah, there was a, a it was on one of these photographic uh, hmm. talks that you know they had on television or a couple of years ago. Yeah. I've seen it somewhere. I can't remember where it was at the club. Someone come in and did, did a talk, or it was on the telly. But yeah. of course, it, it, there's a, there's a philosophical question behind that, which is once the photograph has been taken, then it's a photograph. It's an object in itself, and it, it carries its own meaning with it, uh, which which can change from time to time. So meanings of photographs can change over time. So the whatever the actual person felt about the time when it was photographed, once the photograph exists, it, it takes on a life of its own, which that photograph certainly did. Yeah. Right, it's quarter past nine. I think we should yeah. press on. Yeah, let's crack on everybody's back by the look of it. Okay, all right, cool. In which case, let me just get back. point that I, I, I've noted in a lot of those sort of Victorian ones, where now, oh, you've got to catch the eye and things like that, it was very much almost a deliberate don't look at the camera. Yeah, with the camera and photographs. Mm. Yeah. And well, they I, were having to hold on to the chair uh, because of movement. They just don't move. That's true. So some of those photographs are extremely long, three minutes long, those exposures would be, uh, which may well be why Cameron quite often photographed them looking, not looking at the camera because there would have been movement. But I would make a plea, which is uh, quite often um, there, are, there are too many cliches and advice given at, uh, particularly in photographic clubs, about how you should take photographs. The moment anyone says you should do this, I would immediately uh, do something different. But anyway, right, let's get on with it. So I'm going to, I'm going to dive into um, the fascinating world of fashion and celebrity, and particularly with a view to asking a question about whether these images are portraits or not. So um, let's see where we get to. So we all know that fashion and portraiture are extremely umbilically linked. Some of the fam most famous photographs, photographers in the world started off in the fashion industry. So again, if we go back to the beginning and and we look at some of the, the great photographers, so Edward Steichen as an example. Uh, here's his photograph taken as part of a fashion shoot of Gloria Swanson, the, uh, uh, one of the most famous actresses of the silent movie era. Uh, and this was made at the end of a, of a fashion sitting for Vogue magazine. But look how Steichen explains uh, the, how this image was taken. So he says, at the end of the session, I took a piece of black lace veil and hung it in front of her face. She recognized the idea at once. Her eyes dilated and her look was that of a leopardess lurking behind leafy shrubbery, watching her prey. You don't have to explain things to a dynamic and intelligent personality like Miss Swanson. Her mind works swiftly and intelligently. So here we have an example, a really famous photograph it was used extensively um, uh, as part of the um, uh, the the uh, the lore around um, uh, Gloria Swanson, um, uh, but the the actual idea for the photograph, albeit that uh, Steichen hangs the lace in front, she does the acting. All the the act, the, the posing is actually coming from her. So, I again I come back to my little thesis that um, that actually the the sitter is easily as involved in the photograph as the photographer, if not more so. A lot of the meaning in inverted commas of a photograph comes from the person being photographed, and what they are doing as they are photographed, what they want to project as they are photographed, as it does come from the photographer. And I find that a fascinating, a little dynamic. Here's another picture by Steichen slightly later. This is uh, Marion Morehouse, who was a model, famous model in a Cherowit dress. Cherowit is a fashion design designer, still exists now, I think. Um, and I would go, I would look at this one. I go, um, that actually this probably isn't so much a portrait anymore. This really is, this is about the clothes and what the clothes imply, which is this sort of flapper-esque 1920s uh, style. Now, Marion Morehouse herself came to symbolize a sort of uh, 
American woman, beautiful, smiley, breezy, self-confident. But in this particular picture, I don't think this is really a portrait. It's actually a fashion shot. It's less about her. It's more about the dress. Here's a, a, British, a famous British photographer, uh, a society photographer, Cecil Beaton, taking a picture of Princess Marina, Duchess of Kent. Again, this photograph, this is all about a glamour, charm, lifestyle, wealth. Look at her pearls, look at her earring, look at the hat. That's a fake backdrop in the, uh, in the back. She's being photographed in a studio here. It's all about creating an image around the, the character. Here are uh, a couple of photographs again, which are, I think um, they're clearly uh, in strict definition, i.e. it's an expression of a face. You would say they're portraits, but they're not really portraits. The one on the left is so abstracted, it's, it's not a portrait at all. It's just a series of abstract uh, marks. Uh, and the one on the right, we all recognize Grace Kelly, of course, but this isn't really about Grace Kelly. This is part of the, the fashion and photography shoot that Blumenfeld is indulging here. It doesn't really tell you anything about Grace Kelly. I bet that this is Blumenfeld posing Grace Kelly like this rather than Grace Kelly giving Blumenfeld the photograph. Here's another famous fashion photograph. This is Davina with the elephants. Uh, by Richard Avedon, the man who gave us the, the dress, uh, uh, the, the quotation at the beginning. But again, this photograph, again, this is not a portrait. It's a fashion photograph. It's about the style and the implications of the situation and that, what that means for an evening dress by Dior. Wonderful photograph, though it is. It ain't a portrait. So let's contrast that with some other uh, pictures by uh, my next key photographer, who is Arnold Newman, a wonderful photographer. Again, well worth looking up uh, and inve guess, investigating a bit more. He's known as an environmental portraitist. This particular image is of Igor Stravinsky in 1946. And look, the picture, is, this is definitely a portrait. This tells you everything you need to know about Stravinsky. He's a musician, a composer, he's avant-garde, he's modern. This is the rites of spring written up as a, as a visual image. The big lid of the grand piano looks like an abstracted crotchet of a note. Uh, the the, uh, the um, shading at the back, which is presumably a wall with a corner, again, hints at the abstraction of the music. And yet the figure of Stravinsky himself is what? I don't know, a tenth of the actual uh, real estate of the, the picture. Incredible. All of that packed into this uh, wonderful photograph. I mentioned a little bit earlier that um, uh, the, the importance of uh, contact sheets when we talk about migrant mother in the interval. It's really interesting to look at Stravinsky, uh, the, the Newman um, contact sheet uh, here. It's one of the things I, I think we, I love my digital photography. I think it's uh, on the whole, it's been a fantastic advance for photography. But one of the areas in which we've lost out is the, um, the contact sheet showing us how particular pictures are created. And this is a really interesting one as an example. So Newman has clearly moved Stravinsky around, and got him to pose at certain different areas. And then he's cropped into his image on the bottom right hand one that has become the image. He's decided that he wants to, to create the abstracted uh, picture of Stravinsky, which has then become so famous. Uh, Newman took loads of photographs of, uh, 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 of um, well-known people um, uh, and also people who were important at the time. This one is uh, a picture of Alfred Krupp taken in 1963. Of course, bear in mind that Arnold Newman is a Jewish photographer and here he has taken photographs of a German industrialist who had um, been in charge of the Krupp family um, engineering works throughout the Nazi period. And look at the way that Newman has photographed Krupp here. So he's lit him with two side lights, one from either end. He's placed him in this sort of derelict factory full of the junk of the industrial uh, past behind him. And he's got this deep, dark stripe down the middle. Oh, my God, does he not look like a devil? He looks like a devil. This is the devil staring out at you. Uh, from this picture. It's an incredible portrait. It tells you so much 
about Krupp, about Krupp the man here, this man, who went to jail for uh, his uh, crimes during the Nazi period, but also about the Krupp family. There is a sense that this is a family that has survived eons of time. So the Krupp family dynasty goes back to the Black Death, it survived the Thirty Years' War, both World Wars, the Nuremberg Trials, and so on and so forth. And this is all packed into this one image of this industrialist. An astonishing photograph, I think, and, and quite a collaboration. Uh, it'd be interesting to unpick the, um, uh, the emotional and psychological um, um, uh, background to the making of a photograph uh, between these two characters. Here's another one. This is Picasso. Look at what this tells us about Picasso. This tells you everything you need to know about Picasso in his studio. He's, uh, his intellectual curiosity, his uh, desire to be influenced by everything, his chaotic sort of style of creating art and the pictures that come from it with this very uh, uh, proud and confident man in the foreground. Lovely picture of uh, Picasso in his studio in 1956. Oops. So I want to look at another, I'm still on my theme of um, uh, famous people, celebrities and portraiture and fashion. Um, I'm going to look now at a few pictures uh, that come from a very famous photo shoot called The Last Sitting, which was, uh, the photographer was Bert Stern, the model of course was Marilyn. And these were the last photographs taken of Marilyn before her death. These were taken roughly six weeks before she died. They were ostensibly a photo of um, uh, fashion shoot for um, Vogue magazine. And they were taken in the Bel Air Hotel in LA a little while just before she died. It's really interesting to look at these photographs uh, and to, to look at the difference in, in some of them. So let's start with this one. This has all the initial hallmarks of, uh, hallmarks of a fashion photo, i.e. The, the dress, but it's not really a fashion photograph at all. This is telling you an, uh, an incredible amount in a very sympathetic way about Marilyn the person. So we all know, and indeed at the time, everyone knew the, um, the story of Marilyn. She'd had three failed marriages. She'd had a lot of abortions, miscarriages. She did a disastrous affair with the president and of course you had her death which was about to come. And when we look at this photograph, you look at, you cannot help but see all of that in this photograph. Look at her pose. Look at the way she's clutching one arm around her bodice to her other arm. The, the, her right arm is coming up and covering her face. She's again looking downward, how often that pose comes up. It's so evocative. And then you get this black negative space created by the dress. It's a portent of what is about to come. A fascinating photograph. Absolutely not what you would expect from the sort of public image of Marilyn. Here's another uh, interesting uh, comment on contact sheets. When uh, the shoot was over, as always happened when you photograph famous people, they, they had veto over the photographs. So Bert Stern had to send Marilyn all the contact sheets and the negatives from the shoot. And Marilyn decided to take a, a felt tip pen and go through the contact sheets and crossed out the pictures that she didn't like, which is what we see here. But then she also took a hairpin and went through all the negatives and destroyed the negatives of the pictures that she didn't like. So they were unus uh, unusable. Stern said he was upset, even felt some anger, but as he re later realized, she hadn't just scratched out my pictures, she'd scratched out herself. Here's a, a perhaps a, a slightly more uh, what we'd expect from a shoot of Marilyn, the pinup girl par extraordinaire with a diaphanous veil and the nudity. This is what you'd sort of expect the doe eyed Marilyn pinup figure uh, to be. Here's a fashion photograph. This is, this is fashion, this is Marilyn. This isn't telling you about Marilyn. This is taking the idea of Marilyn and draping it with jewelry, uh, a sort of come hither type look in her face. But it doesn't tell you about Mar anything about Marilyn. And then you get a photograph like this popping up. And this tells you so much about the reality of her character. And it's given by Marilyn to Bert Stern. This is a presentation to him of the figure. I, I think that the massive gap on her back makes her look so vulnerable 
and the face with the hand on the face and the other arm twisted around the back, the slightly contorted figure, tell you a lot about her social and psych uh, her psychological uh, feeling at the time. And I think that is something which the model herself, Marilyn herself, has offered to Bert Stern and he's taken the photograph. And these are the ones that really uh, create uh, an emotional co connection with us as viewers because we know uh, so much about Marilyn in the, uh, in the uh, intervening period. The most famous woman in the world. How do you photograph her? Well, that was Marilyn. Uh, oh, and uh, the last, I, I, I put this one in because I thought it would be nice just to finish on a more positive note about Marilyn. It looks like this is the last shot from, uh, from that particular shoot. And it looks like at least they had a lot of fun taking the photograph. So it looks like they've had a bit of booze and they've chucked a few clothes all over the place. It looks like they've had uh, a good time, which is, I think is a, a nice image to focus on uh, from that sitting. But the question of how do you photograph the most beautiful woman in the world? Well, perhaps that reared its head again uh, with Mario Testino's photographs of Diana in 1997. Now, just to refresh our memories, this is after the divorce and it's when Diana is sort of re-establishing herself as an independent modern woman. Uh, and again, these are ostensibly fashion photographs. They were taken for Vanity Fair. They were meant to demonstrate a whole load of clothing. But of course, this isn't about the clothing at all. This is about Diana as a woman who has been wronged by a family and has gone through a rather horrible divorce. And she's re-establishing herself through the lens of Testino as how she wants her, her herself to be perceived in the public consciousness. In other words, she is giving Testino this photograph um, because she knows how it's going to be disseminated through the world. Contrast that, for instance, with this picture of Diana by Terence Donovan. Terence Donovan is a wonderful photo photographer, but this image is not about really about Diana as a character. It's a posed shot. It's a shot that is flat in meaning. It maybe tells you a little bit about the fact you can just see in her eyes that she was perhaps a little bit of a, a lost innocent in a world that she didn't understand. But to be honest, it's relatively lacking in emotional or psychological insight. Uh, here's one where Diana knew exactly what the emotional impact of a picture would be. Uh, this is just before the, it's during the breakup, but before the divorce, uh, Diana had been abandoned by um, Charles, who refused to go with her as she went to visit, or he went off to do some, some, something else, and she went alone to the Taj Mahal, which of course is a dedication to a, 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 a loved wife, uh, and the fact that she's there by herself becomes a huge irony. Portraiture becomes a weapon here. Uh, and the last picture of Diana, again, by, from the Testino uh, photo shoot. Again, this is Diana. She, you, can, you feel her laughter and her joy and her, her self-establishment, her re-establishment as a proper character, independent and having survived. She is a survivor. And I think all of that comes through here. And that is being given by the, uh, the sitter to the photographer and through her to us as viewers. A uh, fascinating dynamic going on here. Here's a picture of John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Again, uh, just on the theme of last pictures, this is the, the last picture that was taken of uh, John and Yoko just before John got shot when he left the, the hotel after this photo shoot. It's taken by Annie Leibovitz, who again is a, a wonderful uh, photographer of the, of the rich and famous. Again, I highly recommend looking at her photographs. This is a wonderful photograph that tells us so much about their relationship. It's quite surreal in many ways, partly because of the angle from which it's been shot, looking straight down at them. Uh, and they look, to all intents and purposes, they look like they're falling through the air. It's only the fact that we can see the bed on the right hand side that we know that isn't the case. And look how John is relating to Yoko. Of course, he's naked and he's in a fetal position, a position of great uh, a vulnerability. But look at his hands. He clasps onto her head. He grabs into her hair. She looks slightly distant and he is kissing her cheek. An incredible uh, way of reflecting on their relationship that looks like it's tumbling through the air. An incredible 
uh, shot uh, an amazing thing and shot uh, literally before he was actually shot a few hours later. So uh, just to finish off this section, here's a, a few of mine. This is a studio shot for me again when I'm trying out my uh, my my flash uh, photography, trying to create uh, uh, some pictures of the family. Um, here's one from a Dublin bar. I have absolutely. Uh, I, I guess what I rather like doing is is getting in and uh, um, I quite like just shoving my camera into areas where I can't actually get my head, and then clicking away and seeing what comes out. And sometimes I think I get some quite dramatic pictures. And this, of course, is a portrait, but it's a portrait that focuses mostly on his fingers and the banjo strings. Uh, I think it captures the mood of a Dublin bar uh, with live music uh, rather well. I don't mind that the, uh, the, the face is out of focus. It captures a, a spirit uh, of the time. Uh, I was asked recently to go and photograph uh, an acting troupe. They were doing a rehearsal, needed some publicity material. And I turned up and after we'd taken some photographs of them uh, rehearsing their play, uh, I asked them if they would mind if I just took some photographs of them standing by the window. So the light is coming from the, the camera left and it's just flowing over the, um, the characters. Uh, and it was great. I didn't really get them to pose. I didn't art direct them at all. I just said, look, I'd like to take some portraits. Here we go. And this guy is the director of the play. And God, doesn't he look it? I mean, he just looks like an intellectual. He gave me this look. So I love the fact that he's got his little beard. He's got his little moustache. He's got his quiff over the top with his shaved head around the sides. And he's got his um, wonderful round um, glasses. And he just gives me this look, which says to me that he's an intellectual and in charge. And I really like that one. I think it, it, it works really well. Here's another one which contrasts with the, the previous one, you would never say that this is the intellectual director of the play. It is, of course, one of the actors. And doesn't he look like it? He's got that wonderful little bolt through his uh, eyebrow, and then he's giving me the cheeky look. He's looking up uh, from, uh, from below his eyebrows, very much more um, the uh, sort of avant-garde look uh, of an actor. Here's one of the actresses. She had amazing hair. Uh, this wonderful hair that just uh, was a riot everywhere. And again, uh, I captured that with the camera. And then I had this one, and this is quite an easy one. I, I'm still slightly perplexed by this image. The, the photograph I took was the one on the left. Uh, and the reason I took it was because I thought this was going to be, I thought this was a colour photograph. I thought the green of her eyes match the green of her jacket. I thought that would come out. I thought it would uh, unify the image and it would be uh, a really striking portrait. And then for some reason or other, I decided to have a little play with it in black and white, partly because I think I'm a better black and white photographer than I am a color photographer. So I played with it in black and white and hey presto, I got this picture. And I think the black and white photograph is better. Um, and I still, I'm still slightly perplexed as to why that might be so. It may be that the green of the jacket is just too dominant in the, in the, uh, in the first picture, and I, and I haven't managed to create enough focus on the eyes with the colour, that my memory and my visual sight of her eyes was different from the way the photograph actually recorded it, the camera recorded it. And maybe the, the eyes look powerful enough on the black and white right hand photograph because I've taken away the the pull of the jacket in green maybe that's it I don't know yeah I'm very happy to discuss them and get any ideas from you guys at the end of the uh, of the talk so have a think about that what do you think about the difference between color and black and white why does one work sometimes and the other work other times here's uh, another posed photograph that uh, I did this was a, a photo shoot this is one where I did art direct it all I wanted to create an image that was based on a painting by Degas of a ballet dancer. So I, uh, I got the ballet dancer to pose in this particular uh, fashion. I got myself up on a ladder and shot down at her and then I superimposed it on uh, the, the original by Degas uh, in, the, in the appropriate position. Uh, so a posed uh, portrait of a ballet dancer. Okay, so let's come on to our uh, next theme, portraiture and notoriety. I wonder if anyone can guess uh, what these images are. They are, of course, uh, the very first mug shots. Uh, the one on the left is of a lady called Anne Vickers who stole a watch from a person in uh, 1862. And get this, on the right you have uh, Isaac Ellery, who apparently in 1853 was sent to Australia for seven years for stealing four cushions. 
gosh, that is quite some punishment. Uh, but these are pictures, of course, they are portraits, and they're portraits very much in the literal sense. Mug shots are about recording the literal image of a person. They're not supposed to look into the, uh, use the eyes as uh, windows to the soul. They're not really meant to give you any insight into the inner life of a person at all, although you could argue sometimes they do. Here's uh, one of the most famous uh, 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 crime photographers of all time. His name was Ouija. Uh, he was uh, um, uh, a really interesting character, slightly um, uh, surreptitious and slightly odd. He used to, uh, um, he had a, um, a shortwave radio. He used to listen into the radio broadcasts in American cities, New York and Chicago. And then he would beat the police to uh, whatever crime scene was taking place. So he could be first there. Uh, and hence he got his name, Ouija, like a Ouija board. He had an uncanny knack of getting there, um, uh, getting to the scenes of crime, often before the police. And he had a dark room in the trunk of his car. So he would take photographs, process them really quickly, type up the story and get it on the front pages for the following day's papers. Here's an example of one of his photographs of a cop killer. Uh, a really interesting one, I think. I mean, to, to a certain extent, I think there's a certain amount of sympathy in this uh, photograph for the cop killer. He looks, well, he looks, first of all, like he's been beaten up by the cops. He's handcuffed to the chap on the left. He's being uh, manhandled by the guy on the right. They're obviously taking him in front of the, um, the board to take a photograph, to probably to take his mugshot. But he does look, he looks, again, that downcast eye creates a sense of vulnerability which is extraordinary given that this is a man who presumably if we are to uh, believe the the background was a cop killer the last sort of person that you would have any sympathy for but the the, the way this image is constructed maybe does give you a little bit of sympathy for him uh, here are a couple of um, uh, famous characters uh, i wonder if anyone recognizes these mug shots par excellence anyone recognize this one it is of course al capone yeah. the man who was eventually arrested and sent to Alcatraz for tax evasion. Although if you look at Al Capone's face there, windows being the eyes to the soul in this case, you wouldn't want to get anywhere near Al Capone's soul. He has madness hidden and written behind those eyes all over the place. That slightly leery grin he's got is one where you, know, you don't want to mess with this chap. Uh, here's the one, and if anyone recognizes this young man, um, it is, of course, Frank Sinatra. Did you know that Frank Sinatra got arrested and had his mugshot taken? Uh, it, was, it was quite early in his career. He was in his early 20s. He'd been caught having an illicit affair with a married woman, which was against the law and had been arrested for it. Uh, he went on to greater things, of course. And here's our own Hugh Grant, a mugshot to, to record his features. But again, you look into him and you go, oh, my God, I, I can, you can feel exactly what is going on in Hugh's face. You know that he's, he's been caught um, literally with his pants down and uh, he knows he's going to be splashed all over the papers. And you can see all of that going through his mind as he looks at the, the camera here. Another classic example of this is a mugshot, which is meant to be a literal depiction of a, of a person. But actually, the, the person being photographed is telling you so much about what is going on in the background behind those eyes. Mugshots rapidly became a bit of a fashion icon, so um, Bowie and Elvis never got arrested a lot, at least as far as I know, but uh, these are pseudo mugshots that have been created as art photographs instead um, in a rather interesting way. So we'll come to our penultimate chapter now. We're going to look at very briefly at a couple of uh, uh, interesting areas, politics, war, race, and gender, and see how um, portraiture has been involved in there. We come, first of all, back to our famous photograph of, uh, of Winston uh, by Yusuf Kash. So um, um, Churchill had been waylaid for this photograph. He didn't know he was going to be photographed. It was, uh, he had, Kash had about two minutes to photograph him whilst he was moving around the House of Commons. And there's a great story as to how this photograph actually happened. And we should, we should read from Kash, Kash's own words. So Churchill's cigar was ever present. I held out an ashtray, but he would not dispose of it. I went back to my camera and made sure that everything was all right technically. I waited. 
He continued to chomp vigorously at his cigar. I waited. Then I stepped towards him and without premeditation, but ever so respectfully, I said, forgive me, sir, and plucked the cigar out of his mouth. By the time I got back to my camera, he looked so belligerent he could have devoured me. It was at that instant that I took the photograph. A wonderful story of the interaction between photographer and sitter that has given us one of those images that echoes down through the ages and sort of almost defines Britishness. Incredible. <clears throat> Here's another political figure that we all recognise, uh, this one of Margaret Thatcher taken by Harry Borden in 2006 for Time magazine. Um, Borden had 12 minutes to take a photograph of the Iron Lady. Uh, he said the eyes closed portrait was one of the last frames in the shoot and was taken using natural daylight. I hadn't planned it, she just blinked. And the idea for the picture came into my head. I asked her just to close her eyes. Even when I was taking the shot, I knew it was going to be an iconic picture. Why is it an iconic picture? Well, she has all the attributes that we associate with Thatcher. She's got the, uh, the, uh, the pearls, the, the earring, the brooch. She's got the quaffed hair. And yet she does look so vulnerable in this. She looks like she's reflecting on her past. And I think that makes this image uh, so strong. Um, this is obviously after her period in power. And it makes that the, uh, the image so strong. We think that she's imagining back over what had happened in her political career. Uh, again, uh, um, I come back to that idea of eyes being the window to the soul. And here's an example where that's particularly true. It's one of the famous pictures by Don McCullin. I'm sure you all know Don McCullin of a shell-shocked U.S. Marine in 1968, taken during the Tet Offensive. This was towards the end of the uh, Vietnam War. The, the poor chap has been uh, so uh, shell-shocked, he's, he's lost his mind. Uh, and you see that in his eyes. As you look into his eyes, his eyes have got that thousand-mile stare. Uh, he, he, there, there is nothing going on behind those eyes anymore. Clearly... Um, representative of, of what he's gone through and of course it was a very powerful image one of the many images that started to turn the tide against the war in the US and, uh, and US involvement and I want to just pause on this one this is about uh, gen uh, race it's a, a picture that was very famous in its time 1967 which I think it's 53 years ago now I just want you to pause and, and have a look at it um, I think in many ways our, our impressions of race have changed since uh, this image was taken. So we have to contextualize it as a picture from the 1960s. But it is a really fascinating image and, uh, 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 and it was taken by Gary Winogrand who is a wonderful street photographer. And, and the stories behind it are rather interesting. So this is a, a, a picture of the same couple with uh, the chimpanzees. Uh, but taken by a different photographer who was mates with Winogrand. They were there in Central Park together. Uh, and the frame was called Todd, Papa George. Uh, Papa George apparently saw this couple first of all, and he, uh, and he went to take their photograph, and this is what he took. Uh, and then Winogrand shoved him out of the way to get his picture. And Winogrand had seen something in the picture that hadn't occurred to Papa George. He'd seen something and he tried to photograph it. It's quite interesting just to flick between the two pictures. Which one is more powerful? This one, or this one? And I think we'd all recognize that this one is by far the more powerful picture and it's interesting to investigate why it's so powerful. And I turn uh, uh, to, to help explain that to uh, Hilton Owls, who is an African-American writer. And as she describes it, she, she says, we see a white woman and a black man, apparently a couple, holding the product of their most unholy of unions, monkeys. In projecting what we will onto this image about miscegenation, our horror of difference, the forbidden nature of black men with white women, we see the beast that lies in us all. Uh, and it is incredible how you look at this image and there are certain things that go through your mind which you just, which you just feel are shocking uh, when you look at a picture like this. So again, meaning here is completely in the eye of the beholder rather than the picture. Okay, our last area is postmodernism. So let's have a, a little quick definition of what postmodernism is. We talked a little bit about the modernist era. I said it was about the era of production, about the machine era, etc., etc. Well, postmodernism is trying to unravel that. It's about reproduction as well. It questions everything about the nature of 
re representation so it undermines itself it challenges originality subjectivity authenticity and authorship of art and the classic example of that is a uh, uh, a lady photographer called Cindy Sherman and here she is and what she does is she recreates uh, scenes out of um, B and C list Hollywood movies that, that uh, capture uh, cliche images of women but she always puts herself into the picture so this is this is a self portrait of Cindy Sherman acting out a scene from a B-list movie here she is again acting out another scene from a B-list movie. She's mimicking the stills used to publicize and um, produce these films. And by doing so, she questions the stereotypical portrayal of women in uh, culture and therefore undermines it. And this is how the postmodern uh, self-portrait uh, works in the art of Cindy Sherman. Here's a completely different way of approaching um, the use of uh, portraiture and camera work. Uh, the, the photographer here is Nan Golden. She had an exhibition on in London a couple of years ago. Some of you may have seen it. Uh, and she turns the camera on herself and she uses the camera to, uh, to portray her own life in excoriating detail quite quite brutal uh, the uh, particular series of photographs that this one comes from is called the ballad of sexual dependency uh, she used uh, her camera to, uh, to record her life uh, this one is uh, uh, a photograph of herself one month after being battered by her boyfriend at the time an abusive uh, a relationship really shocking image really difficult to look at there's no this is not an aesthetic uh, image. It's an image of uh, uh, excruciatingly honest uh, self-revelation. Quite difficult to look at, I think. We have a, a photographer ourselves uh, in Britain who uh, who takes a lot of pictures, portraits of uh, the British um, uh, character, who is also quite often um, uh, equally liked and loathed, I think, uh, in the photographic world, and that's Martin Parr. Uh, he'd taken a lot of pictures, came to to um, to notoriety or fame, depending on how you want to look at it, with a series called The Last Resort, which is in the 80, early 80s, where he photographed a lot of sort of um, down market, um, Thatcher abandoned um, uh, holiday resorts uh, and photographed the people in them. The question around him is, is he exploiting them or is he sympathetic to them? You can make up your mind as you look at some of these images. So here we have an ice cream parlor. You can make your mind up whether you think that is a sympathetic image. What about this one? Uh, is it exploitative? I mean, we see an elderly couple, couple having fish and chips with the detritus of litter all over them. There's the really uh, sort of almost like surreal type uh, sub characters in the image as well. The woman who's pointing out the image, the baby that's licking on a, an ice cream and it's stroller on the left hand side whilst all of this stuff is going on around it. Uh, I don't know really whether I like Martin Parr or not. I find his pictures quite shocking, I think. And then if we come to uh, um, someone like Gary Schneider, this is a, a photographer, an art photographer who he goes back and uses perhaps some of the techniques that we might almost associate with uh, Julia Margaret Cameron right at the very beginning. He takes long exposure photographs of portraits. So what he does is he invites his sitter to come in uh, into a darkened room and then he uh, sets up the camera and then in the dark he will light paint their face over a period of up to 10 minutes. It's like the opposite of the decisive moment. Uh, he gets these weird effects where the, the flesh looks very, very odd. It looks very bruised. It looks uh, sort of alive. And he says it's an attempt to reveal the sitter. He says that, uh, uh, that we know how to project at the camera. We've talked about that a lot through all of this um, uh, talk. So I made another way. I found another way to make a portrait that would break through the camera face. I want to believe it is the accumulation of all the expressions that they were making during the exposure, what they were thinking, what they were feeling, and what they were projecting. So you get these incredible portraits, which I find very, very powerful, um, uh, of people who have been lit with a tiny, tiny light over a period of, of up to 10 minutes. Okay, a couple of photographs just to finish off. Um, 
from Latin Camera Club of mine. You will know Dan Beecroft over in Harlow. I'm, sh I'm sure you're sick of some of his images that keep coming up. Here's, here's one, Dismaland. He is a postmodern. He would never call himself a postmodern photographer, but he is, uh, as he debunks uh, many of the, the stories and myths around. Here he is taking a poke at uh, Disney World and Disneyland uh, with his ironic uh, uh, anti Dismaland type photographs. Here's another one from Ian Riley, who of course is president of Loughton at the moment of Kill Bill. Again, this is a, a sort of, he, he uses his daughter here uh, to pose for him. Gosh, I hope he gives her a lot of pocket money. The things that she has to do for him uh, in the photographs and all the makeup she has to put on uh, is, is quite incredible. She, she deserves modeling rates. Uh, for the photographs that she does. Here's another one of hers. Again, it tells such a fantastic story. Ian's very good at this, but creating stories uh, through his pictures, the runaway, we see the, the wedding venue that the girl is escaping from. She's got all the, the blurred mascara running down her face as she wears the wedding dress. All fascinating. I have a go occasionally at uh, doing the odd um, a bit of photo trickery myself. This was a lockdown photograph. Uh, where I got my daughter to hover above uh, the bed and uh, I wanted to try and imply she was, she was having a dream. This was for a club um, uh, uh, session, which we had to take photographs of Serenity. I think it was Serenity. Anyway, so this was my idea, Serene Dream. Uh, and I used the flash there just to light her face and the little dog in the, the background. If anyone wants to know how I did it, you'll have to ask me at the end. Um, Here's a, a, another one of mine. This is a, 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 a rather interesting portrait, I think, of a, of a builder who was working on the, the house extension next door. Oh, my God, he looked ferocious with all his tattoos everywhere. Um, but I, I um, girded my loins and thought, I'm going to go and have a chat with him. He looks too great to, not to uh, try and take a photograph of him. And, of course, he turned out to be a pussycat and really lovely. Uh, and he didn't mind at all that I wanted to take some photographs. So here's his back. This is a double portrait. We've got the Chinese emperor there looking all fierce on his back with just the hint of his own uh, face at the top as he looks away uh, from me. Here he is from the front. Gosh, look at those tats. They go all the way, all over his face. But Kim, lovely guy, very, very easy going. Didn't mind being photographed at all. In fact, I think he quite enjoyed it. Here's uh, one of mine. This is um, The Dancer. Uh, a photograph where I used uh, selective focus and depth of field to try and create a little bit about the backstory of this of this chap. So, of course, what I'm focusing on is not his face at all or his torso. It's it's actually his big toe um, and and the foot around it, the shoe around it, to show the uh, the dedication that he has to his uh, art yeah. dancing. Uh, here he is in a more traditional style portrait. Um, with him looking just over his shoulder. Uh, I managed to get him to take a, a, take a few of his uh, portraits in action. This is taken obviously with a very, I think a multiple um, uh, shutter speed to try and get the, the, um, the acrobacy of his um, dance moves as well. And, and you don't know that you've got these shots until you look at them later on the, on the computer and you realize that, hey, he'd made a perfect uh, cross in the middle of my photograph. So. That one was, was quite a, a nice photograph. During part of his dance routine, he was with Michelle, who is dance partner. And I just happened to be standing behind them as they came together in this sort of embrace as part of their dance. But that's not what the photograph actually says, is it? I mean, you, it's amazing how you can take a photograph, take it away from the, the literal moment of the photograph, a little bit like migrant mother discussion we were having earlier. You take it out of that context, give it a different title, and it becomes something else. All of a sudden, these are lovers in embrace with the ring suddenly becoming a wedding ring, et cetera, et cetera. And it has overtones of meanings that were not there, definitely not there at the moment. This is meaning being imposed on a photograph. And here's my last photograph of Ruben. I was, uh, I think we were in Primrose Hill, or somewhere like that. And I was just lying down on the grass and letting him do his stuff. And hey presto, suddenly I had a picture of him flying through the air uh, uh, in a most dramatic um, fashion. So here is my very last photograph of the evening. I thought I'd um, uh, finish off with a picture of my dog, Rufus. 
a looking very Rufus-ish, that is a very classic look that he gives me, just to show that it's not only humans that pose and portray themselves, it's a dog as well. And here he is uh, giving me exactly that sort of look. So what have we done today? I think we started off by trying to pick out a few definitions for portraiture and then we've uh, traced the history of portraiture through um, the Victorian start. Uh, we've looked at uh, um, how uh, Julia Margaret Cameron created those wonderful images, those pictorialist images right at the beginning. We've then looked at the post First World War era, we've looked at modernism, we've looked at some of the categories of August Zander. Um, we've then looked at um, uh, how the blending of uh, fashion and portraiture is really interesting and how sometimes you can look at a, apparently a, um, a, a fashion photograph uh, that is not, not actually about fashion at all, that's very revealing of the sitter's character and the sitter's inner life. And then we looked at um, some slightly more uh, different photographs and we went uh, into the world of race and gender and politics and a little bit of war uh, and then we finished off with Pope's bonding. So it's been a hot trot through the history of portraiture. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've seen some photographs uh, that you've liked, maybe one or two that you haven't liked quite so much, but they're interesting nevertheless. Always good to uh, engender a debate. Um, there's my email address there. If anyone does have any questions or wants to comment or send me any information, please do so. It's only to, uh, I'm a very, very open and welcoming of um, broadening the debate about photography. I, th I find it so wonderful. And of course, my last plug is any if anyone wants to have a look at uh, uh, doing a, a photo workshop, then there's Quest Photos uh, website, you can have a look at that. So I'm gonna stop sharing now and I will open, uh, open the floor if anyone has any questions or comments or, uh, or anything. Now <laughs> Just a comment, um, one of the couple of the photos, you know the one that had Grace Kelly and it leaned up against the door frame? Yeah. The other picture on the other side, was that Marilyn Monroe? No, it's not. It's so this looks like not. the very picture, one of the Marilyn Monroe pictures, had the very similar eye and the same lipstick and yeah. the beauty spot. Yeah, no, it's called Doe Eye. I, think it, I don't think it is Marilyn. I think it's, um, I, don't, I'm, I don't know who the model is, but I don't think it's Marilyn. No. Yeah. Striking image. Right. Well, um, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, ride through the, the world of portrait photography and the history of it. Um, one of the strange things with um, Zoom talks is that normally I have to wait till after the speaker has gone and then people come up and say, oh, he was rubbish or, oh, we'll get him back. He's great. Um, but uh, this time I've just been sitting here with chat messages keep coming flying in to me. Uh, one-to-one -one chat messages saying, oh, he's really good, get him again, and I like this, and it's great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I think you've done amazingly, Tom, uh, and I'm sure you've held everybody's interest through the whole of the, whole of the evening, and, and I, I found it fascinating to, uh, portrait's not an area that I particularly know very much about, and the history of it as well it was great to learn a lot about it. So um, I certainly enjoyed it, and I think everybody else did. did. Good. Yeah, good. Good. Um, I mean, if we can... If we can give a, a thanks in the usual H2 way, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, that was really good. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks very much, Tom. We've got a long list of photographers, Neil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>